Welcome to the Biblical Languages Podcast, brought to you by Biblingo. I'm Kevin Grosso, your host for this episode, and today we'll be talking about basic morphology concepts. This is the second episode in our series on Biblical Language Linguistics. And these introductory episodes are just to orient us to the field of linguistics and to introduce some of the terms and some of the issues that linguists are dealing with today. So in today's episode, we will be discussing morphology. Morphology is all about morphemes. In the first episode on semantics, we defined a morpheme briefly as a meaningful unit of language. There are two parts to this definition. First, a morpheme is a unit, and second, it is meaningful. As a unit in language, a morpheme typically has a sound associated with it, whether that sound forms a whole word or not. For example, a word like caps has two morphemes associated with it. One is the lexical item cap, and the other is the plural suffix s, which is just a morpheme that attaches to the end of a word. There are all kinds of different forms that morphemes take across languages. We will just call them affixes, which is just any grammatical element that attaches to a word, whether it attaches to the beginning, middle, or end of a word. So just like with semantics, we started out with the task, trying to figure out what we're actually trying to do in semantics. We'll do something similar with morphology. So this is a quote from Embic. Um, He has a book called The Morpheme, and this is how he begins his book. At the most basic level of description, a grammar consists of a set of primitive elements and a set of rules for deriving complex objects out of those primitives. According to the view that is developed in this book, the primitive elements are morphemes, and the system responsible for combining morphemes into complex structures is the syntax. So then he goes on to say what the main question he's going to try to answer is in the book, The Morpheme, right? And really what morphologists are trying to do. And he says, this is the question. What is the nature of the primitive units of derivations, i.e. what is the nature of the morpheme? How do morphemes relate to syntactic, semantic, and phonological information? So next week we will talk about syntax. But this week, we will focus on the morpheme. So the morpheme is this basic primitive unit in language, right? And it's meaningful, and it's organized in a certain way. So the organization of the morpheme, he says, is all about syntax, which we'll discuss, like I said, next week. Um, But this week, we'll focus on kind of the, um, the middle ground, right, between semantics and syntax. It's the morpheme. It's these individual units Um, that have to be taken by the syntax, organized in a certain way, right? And those units are meaningful. They have semantic content, okay? So the, just like last time with the introductory episode on semantics, we had an example sentence. We also have an example sentence in this episode, and it is the dermatologist hugged a pretty girl who was well-read in the latest journal articles on the breeding of oxen. And that might be an odd sentence to you. It is an odd sentence, but it is perfectly intelligible, and we will discuss different parts of different words of this sentence throughout. So here is an outline. Um, again, so if you're listening to this, I will go over it. We will be discussing morphology in terms of semantics today. So um, you can view morphology in several different ways, right? Right morphology often has a phonological component. So, um, you know, morphemes have a a certain character um, to them, a certain sound associated with them, right? And so we we could, you know, spend the entire time discussing different kinds of ways morphemes can appear in in languages uh, as far as what sounds they make. But instead, we will focus on how um, the kinds of meanings that morphemes have in, in languages. So that's that's what we'll be focusing on. Um, it's not that phonology is unimportant. Phonology is just the study of sound systems and how they how the sounds interact um, in a language. They it is important, and sometimes it affects the semantics as well. Um, but we are trying to figure out 
um, what words mean. And so semantics for us is, is the most important. So this is morphology for semantics. So in the beginning, we will discuss um, derivational versus inflectional morphology, and that's really going to frame our entire discussion. So that's that's the two basic categories in morphology are derivational and inflectional morphology. So we're going to discuss that, you know, just introduce it, figure out what those terms mean. And then within derivational morphology, we will discuss roots, categorizers, derivational affixes, and compounding. So again, roots, categorizers, derivational affixes, and compounding all fall under derivational morphology. Okay, so that's what we'll discuss. That'll be basically part one. And then in part two, we will look at inflectional morphology. Um, and within that, we will focus on inflectional morphology on nouns, adjectives, and verbs. So that'll be part two, and then we will conclude at the end. So what is derivational and or inflectional morphology? If you remember from last time in the semantics episode, we discussed functional morphemes and lexical morphemes. So if you're looking at this, um, this is the same exact slide we had last time. So we said functional morpheme. Um, in order to define it, we said it is a meaningful grammatical element that usually has a logical meaning. And we italicized the examples um, in our sentence, and we've done the same here. Words like the, a, who, in, the, on, the, of, right? Those are all of the uh, functional morphemes in our in our sentence, including the ed suffix on, on hugged. And this we contrasted with lexical morphemes. And a lexical morpheme is a meaningful lexical element that usually has an abstract meaning with at least some elements that cannot be logically represented. And we underlined those examples, things like dermatologist, hug, pretty, girl, etc., etc. Okay, so we made this basic distinction between functional and lexical morphemes. And we had all kinds of characteristics associated with those. So, for example, um, functional morphemes normally have logical meanings. Lexical morphemes have a logical meaning components. This doesn't mean they don't have meanings that are logical. There are some, um, probably some logical meanings within lexical morphemes, but it's not that logical meanings um, encompass all of their meaning, right? That's the idea. We said that the inventory for functional morphemes is limited and it's a closed class. It's very hard to create a new functional morpheme, though it happens. Um, lexical morphemes is unlimited, open. We, we add new words all the time. So some examples we said for functional morphemes were gender, number, determiner, tense, aspect, degree words, WH elements, negation, etc. And examples for lexical morphemes we said were verbs, nouns, and adjectives, and adverbs. Okay, so... I go back to this now because this is the basic split between derivational and inflectional morphology, okay? So in derivational morphology, it's all about the creation of lexical morphemes. And inflectional morphology is all about the marking of grammatical elements on words using functional morphemes. So the idea is that derivational morphology, right, is going to help us figure out what a lexical morpheme is and means. And inflectional morphology is gonna help us figure out what a certain noun, verb, or adjective means, right? One, and also its its grammatical role in the sentence, okay? So, so that's the basic split between derivational and inflectional morphology. So in this first part, when we talk about derivational morphology, we'll be talking about lexical items, right? And in the second part, when we talk about inflectional morphology, we will be talking about grammatical items with logical meanings, okay? So just a preliminary um, couple definitions here. So it's actually very difficult to define something like the word word, <laughs> um, but I think this is a necessary place to start when we discuss morphology. So here is just uh, an example of, of a definition. This is from Liber Introducing Morphology, her book in 2009. Um, and then we'll also define lexeme. 
So first we have a word. She says it is one or more morphemes that can stand alone in a language. And she you know, says that this is a very simple definition, right? What does it mean to stand alone? Um, it's, it's obviously a, a huge question. Um, it doesn't just mean, you know, orthographically, what can you see, you know, is, is written as one word. That, that doesn't really matter for us. Uh, ma- many languages are not written, and um, written language is just n- not always the best reflection of what's going on in our heads. But the, the basic point is that this is kind of our intuition, right? A word is, um, you know, something that can stand alone. You, we, that's usually defined phonologically, you know, with something like stress. So that is in contrast to a, a lexeme. So a lexeme is a family of words that differ only in their grammatical endings or grammatical forms. So singular and plural forms of a noun, for example, um, present, past, and participle forms of verbs. So she says walk, walks, walked, walking. So depending on how you define word, right, this could be four different words, walk, walks, walked, walking. It is only one lexeme, right? That's the important point here. So the difference between walk, walks, walked, and walking is in the inflectional morphology. It's not in the derivational morphology, okay? So we have a word, right, walk, and th- that's that's been formed, um, you know, using whatever derivational morphology we have in the language, and then we can inflect it in certain ways, right? We can put the S ending, the ED ending, the ING ending, right? And all of those are doing something. They're, they're giving a certain meaning, but it doesn't change the lexical meaning of the word, right? That's that's the idea. We, we still have a different interpretation, and we have to discuss that, but it is the same lexeme, right? That's the point. And again, words, right, can be defined in a lot of different ways, um, but, you know, if you saw walk and walks in a sentence, you know, you you would count that as two different words, right? That's that's the idea. So in this initial part, we will be discussing how we form lexemes, right? Um, because we will be dealing with derivational morphology. So as we said, derivational morphology, um, one of the big things is roots, okay? So that's where we will start. And that's really the best place to start because roots carry the lexical information of a word, okay? So this is our definition, a morpheme that contributes phonological and lexical semantic information to a word. Roots really, the idea of roots has really taken off in linguistics uh, and, you know, people have started analyzing roots to a whole new degree uh, pretty recently. And a lot of it has come from Semitic languages, right? Especially Hebrew, right? Um, just because it's a it's a pretty well studied language, and so Hebrew has a root that is is very obvious, okay? Because it has um, these you know three consonants, um, three letters that are written, and um, you can just see the root very clearly. But what people have said is that all languages have roots. The the system, their morphological system, may do different things with roots. So, for example, roots may be either bound or free morphemes. So a bound morpheme necessarily occurs with another morpheme, while a free morpheme has a meaning standing on its own. So we can see this with um, two words in our sentence, the dermato- dermatologist, right, um, one word, and girl. So dermatologist has a root, derma or dermat. Um, this comes from Greek, right? Derma. And um, the the tau on the end is is um, for the, is present in the genitive, for example, dermatos. Um, so this root in English cannot stand on its own. It has to combine with something else, okay? So you, you can have dermatology, right? But we just don't have, you know, derma, like we do in in Greek, for example. This is in contrast to a root like girl, right? The root girl, which we can form other words from, right? Girly, for example. Um, This root, though, 
can stand on its own. Okay, so it's it's what we would call a free morpheme, whereas diadema in in English is a bound morpheme. Okay, so roots in English can be bound or free, but that's not true in Hebrew and Greek. Okay, so um, in Hebrew and Greek, roots are are always bound because they always co-occur with another morpheme in order to be interpreted. Okay, so for example, in Hebrew, roots, um, you know, without the vowels, we don't know what the word means. Okay, so even if, you know, in Hebrew it used to be written without vowels, but those, those it was never spoken without vowels, right? The, the vowels were there and they help us to interpret the word, right? We can't, we can't interpret the, a root without the vowels there. Even though all languages have roots, it's not true that all languages um, do the same thing with roots in their system. Okay, so one implication of this, right, is that similarity in root does not predict similarity in meaning. Okay, so I'll give an example. Um, again, one of our words in our sentence, uh, the latest journal articles. So the word journal. Um, it has a very different meaning than the word journey, even though they come from the same root, okay? And this similarity, or this dissimilarity, sorry, um, you know, has all kinds of different reasons. I mean, in this case, um, I think, you know, the the words probably did have a meaning similar at some point, but as time progresses, words change and, you know, they can drift, right, and, and change change meaning. Um, sometimes words that have the same root do have a very similar meaning. So, for example, we have journalism and journalist, right? A journalist is someone that does journalism, okay? So, what we have to do, right, when we talk about roots, is we have to decide when, when do two words formed from the same root have a similar meaning and when does it not, right? That's an open question, um, there are lots of, you know, decent answers to this, but one one important thing is, right, is, you know, the, the basic logical error that people make is, okay, we have root X and, you know, t- these two words are both formed from this root, therefore, they, they sh- have this same component of meaning, right? You can't say that, okay? So, so the, the question is, when do do those two words um, have the same or something similar in meaning because they're derived from the same root? Um, and the bigger question is what component of meaning is consistent, right, between the two words because they have the same root? There, I mean, synchronically, we can we can probably say that roots, um, you know, two words formed from the same root do have some similar component in meaning, right? We we, we have to say something like that. Um, but because word meanings change over time, two words that have the same root may, may begin to change in the language, right? May begin to change their meaning. And then it's very hard to determine how they're related, right? And, and, and even how they're related to the same root. But the, the basic point though, is even if we can say that they're related, the question is what sort of component of meaning relates the two? So, for example, journalism and journalist, a journalist practices journalism, okay? But that doesn't necessarily mean that we're always going to have this sort of semantic alternation, right? Um, the, the affix, the, the suffix here, the journalist, right? Um, the ist ending actually does tell us something about the meaning, and we'll, we'll cover this in a minute. Um, but, but that is a starting point on how we can determine how these two words are are related, okay? So this brings us to categorizers. So we have roots, right? Roots are um, a-categorical, right? They don't have a grammatical category to begin with, okay? And they always combine with categorizers. So a categorizer is a morpheme that turns a root into a noun, verb, or adjective. So in English, categorizers may not be audible, we can have basically what's called you know a zero categorizer. So, for example, the word "kick" is a root, and we don't know what category it's in because we have examples like "a kick" or "kicked," right? So, "a kick" 
is a noun. And we know that because the because of the indefinite article a, right? And kicked is a verb because it has a tense marker, ed. So we don't know sometimes in English, um, just by looking at the word, what category it's in. So kick, we just don't know. It, it's a root um, that can be interpreted, right? But we, we don't know what category it's in until we put it in a syntactic context. In Hebrew though, um, categor categorizers are realized as the vowel patterns or templates. So for example, we have melech, um, king, or malach to reign or act as a king, right? Um, we'll just say reign or rule. So the idea here um, is that the vowel patterns or templates serve to categorize the root. And again, you have to have a categorizer in order to interpret it. You don't have a word in Hebrew or Greek that is a root but but doesn't have a categorizer. You'll never find that. So so in order to interpret the the word, we have to have both a root and a categorizer. Okay? So in Greek, category, categories are normally revealed by inflectional morphology. So for example, I can say akoe, um, hearing, versus akuo, um, which is I hear. Okay? Here, um, the eta ending signals it's a noun, and the omega ending signals, okay, this is a, a verb. So like I said, categories um, are formed by these categorizers. Categorizers are morphemes that take a root and make a noun, verb, or adjective. In Hebrew, they're realized as vowel patterns. In Greek, they are inflectional morphology. It helps to categorize the, the roots. Okay? So, the implication of this is a word consists of the semantics of the root plus the semantics of the categorizer it combines with. So if we say, okay, I know, I know roughly the meaning of this root. I've seen, um, you know, different words that are are used with it, and they all have this idea of something being right. For example, we can we can look at the the root tzadik dalet kuf. In this case, right, tzadik has something to do with being right. Okay, and and this root is, is fairly consistent across all the words. Right, it always has something to do with this. So in order to figure out what the different words mean, we have to figure out what the different categories are. So tzadek, uh, you know, is, is is a verb. So it's this root um, combining with a verbal categorizer. Tzadik is the same root combining with an adjective categorizer. And tzedek, again, is the same root combining with a noun categorizer, okay? So these categorizers are going to affect the interpretation, right? They have a meaning. And so they help us to figure out, you know, what the difference, for example, is between the adjective tzaddik and the verb tzaddik. That's an open question, right? That's actually something I worked on in my dissertation. But the idea is that we have consistency in um, the root, and, and again, this root, so some roots, um, you know, have a very broad meaning, and it's it's very hard to figure out what the common element is between all of the different um, instantiations of the root, but this root is, is much easier. It has something to do with being right. Again, you have to define that in the right way, <laughs> of course, um, but then we can start to ask ourselves, okay, what is the difference, the difference between an adjective and a verb, and that should tell us the difference between a word like tzaddik and tzaddik, right? And even tzaddik, right? H how does that fit in? So so those are the kinds of questions people are asking and um, the kinds of questions that looking at categorizers more closely can help us to answer. So next, we move on to derivational affixes. A derivational affix, the way we are defining this, is it's a morpheme that turns a root or word into a noun, verb, or adjective. So from this, a categorizer is a kind of derivational affix. And and really, you know, we the way we define categorizers, we said it it takes a a root and turns it into a word, um, which is is fine. Of course, though, we have 
instances where one word is turned into another word with a different category. Um, so this we're just calling a derivational affix. Um, so for example, in our sentence, we have dermatology be becomes dermatologist. So we have this root derma and that eventually becomes dermatology. And dermatologist, right, is the, the word we actually have in our sentence, um, has the word dermatology kind of embedded in it. And we know that a dermatologist actually is someone who does dermatology or studies dermatology, right? So in this case, again, the it's very transparent what the meaning relationship is between dermatology and dermatologist, okay? So that can help us to determine you know, what other words mean with this ist suffix, for example. Um, you have other examples of this, breed and breeding. Um, breed is a standalone word in English. So, um, you know, we, we could call it the root. And then that combines with the ing suffix to create a noun. Um, we see on the breeding of oxen. Um, alternatively, so there, there are really two analyses of the word breeding. We could say that it is a a noun that combines with a verb or a noun that combines with a root. So if we say that breed is the root, um, we would call that, you know, it would fit under the example we said last time with a categorizer. If we said that breed is a verb, right, which it is, then we say we, we, we would say that you would have a verb embedded under the noun breeding, right? So again, it's kind of an empirical question, depending on the interpretation of breeding, um, what we have here. Derivational affixes are, are really important. Some important implications, um, or one important implication, is that they have meanings. And they may or may not be compatible with certain readings, okay? So an example that I that I have here is apocalypto um, versus apocalypsis. Apocalypto is the, uh, you know, this is reveal, right? I reveal, and then revelation. And the idea is that this is ending has a certain meaning, right? And, and it only comes with certain roots or verbs, depending on your analysis, but it, it has a certain meaning contribution and it's related to the underlying word in a certain way, okay? So this is actually my argument for the relationship between pistis and pistewo, just that this is ending, it's giving us a certain meaning, right? And my argument is that um, it's making a, a noun from a verb. Um, and so the noun that's formed has a verbal idea embedded in it, right? That's the idea. Okay, so this has been well researched in, in English, um, much more so than any other language. I know just like most things in linguistics, people have been talking about you know, nominalizations in particular. Um, so nominalizations is itself um, a word that is formed from many derivational affixes, um, but it is the, you know, the process of creating nouns, new nouns. And so many people have looked at, okay, how are nouns formed and what interpretation do we get, okay? So this is a book from, um, again, from Liber 2016. Uh, it's called The Ecology of Nominalizations. Um, and so she's looking at it particularly in English. And she just goes through all of the affixes that we have in English and she gives the meaning, okay? So um, we have the affix on the left and I'm not gonna go through this whole thing. Um, you can, you know, look at this. So if, if you're listening to this, uh, I'll give kind of a, a sample of it. So, you know, we have a, an affix like meant and the primary category of the, the, the base is a verb or let, let's do Asian. Um, so the, so it's a verb. So we can take examine. Um, this is the one I always go to examine is a verb, right? And examination is a noun that's created. Okay. Um, and so this has a certain interpretation. It has an event interpretation, or it can have a what's called a result interpretation or a referential interpretation. It can refer to something in the real world, world like the examination arrived in the mail. And then there are also other kinds of interpretations. So she says that um, it can be used for agents, um, instruments, uh, patients, 
locatives, paths. So the idea here is not that, you know, each word with an Asian suffix will have those meanings, right? The idea is that the Asian suffix is compatible with those kinds of meanings. So the the word that this suffix combines with may disallow those other kinds of meanings, right? But if the word is compatible with those other meanings, um, then this is how it shows up. That's the idea, okay? So the point here is that we ha we can have all kinds of different meanings. Again, for example, we can think of like, like a word like prayer. Uh, a prayer is, um, you know, something that is produced, right? Um, you have that er suffix, pray, prayer. Um, but as soon as we make it player, right? It's someone that plays. That's an agent, right? And so, so we have this er suffix that's compatible with both of both of these different interpretations, but it the interpretation that surfaces depends on the meaning of the base word, right? That's the idea. So honestly, this is a um, dissertation project for anyone that wants to to do this for Greek and or Hebrew um, to to figure out, uh, you know, how how are nominals formed in these languages and what kinds of suffixes go with different kinds of meanings, but. It's been done for English. Um, it was done in a corpus of, I think she used a corpus of like 50 million words, right? So a lot of words. And that's really what you need to do to to uh, do this well. Unfortunately, we don't have that for for languages like like Hebrew, especially. Um, we, you know, we, we come much closer in Greek, but we're still lacking a lot um, in data. But this is the kind of thing that will help us determine, you know, what, what whole classes are of nouns mean, okay, based on their derivational morphology, okay? So the last um, point in derivational morphology we will touch on briefly is compounding. The idea behind compounding is the combination of two lexemes to form a new lexeme. So the example in our sentence is well-read. Um, so well-read is um, a combination of two lexical items, um, well and read. And we form a new word, right, from that, um, from those two lexemes. So combinations can have various relationships with each other. Um, so, for example, we a can opener is an instrument um, that opens cans. Okay, a dog walker is probably not a an instrument that walks dogs, right? Um, it would be a person probably that's, that walks dogs. I, I've never really. Uh, seen the word dog walker. This is actually an example taken from, from Liber as well. Um, greenhouse uh, is is not a greenhouse, okay? So so in this case, the the two words combine and they they don't form a, a compositional meaning, right, from, from those two words, okay? Um, so this is, you know, would be similar to like an idiom. Right, so this happens sometimes when you combine two lexical items. Is that the, the the final result is not predictable? And you know, maybe at some point there was a more compositional meaning for this. Um, you know, or or uh, you know, the green is referring to you know what's inside, right? We, I, I don't really know the etymology of greenhouse, but the point here is that today a greenhouse can be you know anything, right? As long as um, you know it has certain properties of holding in you know, heat and moisture, etc. Um, and then we have something like blue green, right? Where it's just, okay, the, the, the word blue green just means something in between blue and green. Okay, so again, the when you combine two words, you can have different relationships between those two elements. Um, and, and a lot depends on, you know, the, the, the specific semantics of each word, right? And whether or not you're forming an, an idiom. So some languages form compounds much more readily than others. So for example, um, Greek forms compounds quite readily. Um, English is actually very, very good at, at compound words. Um, Hebrew is quite poor. So there are um, you know, not many examples of compound words in, in Hebrew. Um, you know, Tzal Mavit might be one, something like that. Um, this is usually translated, you know, the shadow of death. You know that's a very a very literal translation, right? And and basically what what we have done in in that translation is said, oh, um, 
there's this component and there's this component and we put the two together it may or may not mean that right um as, as just like greenhouse right um but but the idea here is that um what you have to do to figure out the meaning of a compound right is figure out both components um and then and really look at how it's used okay so that that is the end of our section on um, derivational morphology forming words okay so those are um, the four basic things um, to form words we looked at uh, roots categorizers derivational affixes and compounding and now we're moving on to inflectional morphology okay so this again has to do with functional morphemes and functional morphemes usually have logical meanings and attached to lexical items okay so they attach to nouns verbs and adjectives and we'll discuss adverbs under adjectives so to begin with we'll start with nouns so it's actually very difficult to define the word noun you probably probably learned in school the, the way i learned it actually was a noun is a person place or thing recently i've heard person place thing or idea those kinds of definitions just don't work right um you know a noun can also be an event so you know, there are all kinds of event nominals right um so uh you know examination the examination lasted five hours that's an event so the the problem is that those semantic definitions really don't get at what a noun is and so most of the time you know within linguistics nouns are are defined based on syntax now i i have to to say from the outset of this whole discussion the most comprehensive uh, discussion on lexical categories and what makes a, a category a noun, uh, yeah, a word, a noun, verb, or adjective is a, a book by Mark Baker. Um, this is the most comprehensive that I know of, um, written in 2003, uh, called Lexical Categories. A lot of this discussion is based on him, but I, I, I have simplified it. Um, you know, so he says something like nouns have a refer referential index. I don't want to say that just because I don't want to explain what a referential index is. <laughs> um, but nouns across languages are going to have certain similarities, syntactic similarities, right? Um, so that's kind of what I've what we're focusing on here. Okay, but you can check out his work if you want to delve into these issues more deeply. A noun, the way I've defined it, is a word that can be a complement of determiners, quantifiers, or numerals and can be in an argument position of a verb, okay? So, for example, we have articles and oxen, right? Those are our plural verbs, um, plural, plural nouns, sorry, in this sentence. Um, an important point here is that the, the way the morpheme is manifested does not necessarily affect its interpretation, okay? So, article, um, the plural mor morpheme has an S on the end. The, the plural morpheme of ox is E-N, okay? that um, there's a reason for that and there's you know again this would be a part of morphology to try to figure out the reason for that but for us it doesn't matter right either way it's plural right and 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 they're not going to have a different meaning because the form is different okay so these these nouns can take a plural morpheme other nouns cannot right something like breedings so the classic exa example of this is is waters um, there are certain nouns called mass nouns, right? This is the basic divide, mass nouns and count nouns, um, that don't combine well with plural morphemes. And again, there's all kinds of reasons for that. Um, but the idea is that, um, the semantics of the, the root or the noun might be incompatible with some of these elements with determiners, for example. Um, so that brings us to our next example. Ho Jesus, right? Versus the Jesus. So, you know, Ho Jesus is perfectly fine in Greek. You see it all the time. Um, you know, in a very quote unquote literal translation into English, it would be the Jesus, right? But we, we would never say that. Okay. So proper nouns do not combine well with determiners, specifically um, the definite article um, in, in English. But that doesn't mean they don't in other languages. An important point here is that the semantics of determiners, quantifiers, and numerals help to determine the interpretation of the noun. So the idea here is that ho um is interpreted differently 
right, than the Jesus in English. The Jesus is actually interpretable. There are some contexts in which it makes sense. Um, you know, for example, if I said Jesus came and, and knocked on my door yesterday, you might say, wait, the Jesus came and knocked on, on your door? Um, you know, referring to the Jesus, the one that everyone knows, right? But that would be a, a different interpretation, right, than what we normally find with whole Jesus. So the idea here is that um, we really have two options for why ho Jesus is possible in Greek, um, but, you know, the equivalent form is not possible in English. Either the determiner, the definite article, um, is different in Greek than it is in, in English, or proper nouns are different in Greek um, than in English, okay? Those are the, the only two options because, you know, in, in, in one language, this is grammatical and the other language it's not, okay? Um, you know, I would probably be of the opinion that the, the definite article is different in Greek. Um, and so then the question is, how is it different, right? What makes the definite article compatible with proper nouns in Greek and incompatible with proper nouns in English, right? And that will help us to determine um, what the article means in other places and what nouns mean generally when they combine with you know, the article in Greek versus in English, okay? So this is just a little bit on nouns and some of the things that you have to deal with if you're going to interpret nouns, um, you know, in, in real language, okay? Now we're moving on to verbs. A verb I've defined as a word that has a subject and can be inflected for tense. So in our example, we have the dermatologist hugged right, where hugged was a verb, and we also have a pretty girl who was, where was is also a verb, okay? So we'll begin with this idea that verbs have subjects. So in the dermatologist hugged, dermatologist, or the dermatologist, is the subject of the verb hug. So that's that's very important, very important characteristic of verbs, and, you know, this is actually what Baker says is the defining characteristic of verbs is that they have subjects, right? And and the kind of semantic corollary of this is that verbs are predicates. They are um, words that need something, some other element to complete them, right? If I just said the word hug, I, I, I'm left with an incomplete thought, right? Um, who hugged whom? Um, when I add you know, a subject and a direct object, um, the dermatologist hugged a pretty girl, all of a sudden, I understand what thought you were trying to express, okay? Um, and then verbs are inflected for tense, okay? So, and, and I and I use the word tense here and not aspect um, or mood or modality uh, because it does seem like tense uh, is special in some ways. Um, so, for example, in the Greek system, you know, there, there are... Um, you know, you can argue that the, the participle, for example, is not necessarily a verb, um, but it is inflected for uh, aspect, okay? Um, it's not inflected for tense. So um, here, you know, in English, we have hugged and was both inflected for, for past tense. And that doesn't mean, right, that um, verbs aren't inflected for other things. They, they, they might be, but it's, it's not a defining characteristic of a verb. So the implications of this, right? One is that all verbs have an argument structure and their interpretation may be influenced by the arguments, okay? So um, there is a whole host of um, books and articles you could read on verbs and their argument structures, um, a, a huge field. I would encourage you to go back, if you are interested in this, to go back and listen to our series on lexical semantics where we talk a decent amount about verbs and their arguments. Um, basically, the idea is that if verbs always have arguments, if they always have elements that they have to go with, those elements might be structured in a certain way. And indeed, what we have found is that they are. So there are certain verbs that require agents, other verbs that don't. There are certain verbs that take um, direct objects, other verbs that don't. Um, and all of this affects how we interpret um, verbs and how we, you know, sort verbs into classes, okay? So, for example, um, if I said the dermatologist hugged 
a pretty girl, we would normally interpret that as just a one-time event, okay? Um, and we, we, we see a pretty girl, right, um, is the direct object. It doesn't have a preposition or anything with it. Um, when we change the verb to, let's say, play, we, we would say the dermatologist played a board game with a pretty girl, okay? So in this case, again, um, it's a one-time event, but we can't say the dermatologist played a pretty girl, right? Um, and have this same meaning. It just doesn't just doesn't work. Um, even though we can kind of imagine what that would mean, we would never say it, right? So, so in th the word play does allow a direct object, right? So we can say played a board game, but the the direct object that it allows is the thing played, right? It's a it's a game. Um, it's not the person who you're playing with, okay? So, whereas the word hug, right, requires the person you are hugging to be the direct object, okay? So, this is a difference in argument structure between the two words hug and play. The interpretation um, of a verb also interacts with um, tense and aspect morphology, okay? So, we can, again, say the dermatologist hugged a pretty girl, um, and we would normally understand that to be a one-time event. If I said the dermatologist played with a pretty girl who was well-read in the latest journal articles on the breeding of oxen when they were younger, so if I said, if I added that in the end, when they were younger, we would actually interpret that as habitual. Um, so we would say that that is a case um, where played is interpreted habitually um, because of this, you know, adverbial clause at the end, when they were younger, um, and that is, um, I mean, that's one way, you know, there's, there's many, many ways how a verb interacts with, you know, uh, inflectional morphology, right, and other elements in the clause. So, it would be pretty odd to say the terminologist hugged um, a pretty girl, you know, when they were younger. Um, even, even then, if we said that, we, we wouldn't interpret it habitually, normally, right? So, for whatever reason, something about the semantics of the verb play suggests that when it, when it combines with, you know, a protracted period of time, um, we, we like to interpret it habitually, okay? So, the important point here is that in order to come up with an analysis of the verb play and, the ver and you know, past tense in English, you need to know both meanings, right? How they combine, why you get this sort of interpretation with play, and why you don't get that interpretation with hug. So that brings us to our last category, adjectives. Um, so I, I've left off adverbs. It's debated whether adverbs are a real category. Baker says they're not. Um, he basically just says they're adjectives. And, you know, there are there are all kinds of reasons for him saying that. Some languages don't have uh, adverbs, um, just, you know, just don't, don't exist, and all they use is adjectives. So we, we're going to just focus on adjectives here. Um, and it's not to say, you know, Baker is trying to be, um, trying to figure out, you know, universally, what are the universal categories, right? So he's looking at all kinds of different languages. Um, so, you know, maybe it's the case that some languages have adverbs and some languages don't, um, you know, or, um, you know, adverbs are just special kinds of adjectives. But for us, we're just going to look at adjectives. So we would define an adjective as a word that modifies a noun and can combine with degree morphemes. So the examples in our, in our sentence, pretty, so the dermatologist hugged a pretty girl, um, and then who was well read in the latest, latest is also an adjective, journal articles on the breeding of oxen. So one point to bring up, um, at least in English, nouns can also modify other nouns. Um, so, you know, journal articles um, is, you know, the word journal is also modifying the noun or the, yeah, the noun article, um, just like pretty is modifying girl. Um, there might be differences, differences between the two, Right, um, but 
on the surface, it just looks like nouns can modify other nouns in English in some cases. But um, degree morphology, like the EST suffix, the S, like superlative, prettiest, latest, um, prettier, later, these normally combine with adjectives. So we'll look first at how adjectives can modify nouns and how they can modify nouns in different ways. Okay. So we have, again, our sentence, the dermatologist hugged a pretty girl. So when we say pretty girl, um, that has certain entailments. We can infer from that, rightly, that the girl is pretty and she is a girl. Okay. So the, the adjective combines with girl to say that this, this individual is both of these things. When we say something like the dermatologist hugged a beautiful dancer, all of a sudden that inference doesn't necessarily hold. Beautiful dancer can be interpreted in two different ways. It can be interpreted either as the individual who is dancing is also beautiful. So we can say the dancer or this person is a dancer and this person is beautiful or this person is a um, the way that she dances is beautiful, but she herself is not beautiful. Okay, so adjectives can modify nouns, right? But the the way that they modify those nouns can be different depending on the adjective and depending on the noun, right? So again, for example, if we said beautiful girl, um, the the inferences hold, right? If I said the dermatologist hugged a beautiful girl, um, we know that 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 individual is both a girl and is beautiful. If I said pretty dancer, we we would know that that individual is both a dancer and is pretty. But for whatever reason, when we combine beautiful and dancer, we get an interpretation where you can just say um, that individual is a, um, or dances beautifully, um, but is not necessarily beautiful. Okay. So the point in this is that the semantics of an adjective can modify nouns in different ways, right? And and the noun itself also can be modified in certain ways. This brings us to our last point with adjectives, which is degree morphology and scale structure affects the interpretation of adjectives. So the idea here is just that adjectives can uh, convey different kinds of properties. So one um, way to determine what kind of property an adjective is conveying is to look at an adjective's scale structure. So there are all kinds of different scales, uh, very vast literature on this. Um, I don't want to go into it in too uh, much detail here, but I'll just point out this these examples, pretty girl and hungry girl, just to show how um, adjectives can encode different kinds of properties, right? And, and ultimately, people have related this to their scale structure. Um, most adjectives have scale structure, some adjectives don't. So for example, we can have a word like wooden. Um, it's hard to say that something is, you know, more wooden than something else. Um, when we do say that, what we normally mean is uh, something, you know, has more components that are wooden than something else. So for example, this house is more wooden than that house would normally mean that, you know, um, this house uh, has more wood in it, right, percentage-wise or something than um, than that other house. But but still, words like that really um, are usually analyzed as not having um, scale structure. Um, but but most adjectives do. So so when we say you know a sentence like the dermatologist hugged a pretty girl, um, what's interesting about the property of pretty is that it um, is constant for the individual, right? There, There is no um, sense in which we can say, okay, this girl was pretty yesterday, but not pretty today. Um, at least we, that's not normally how we think about the word pretty. Whereas um, another adjective like hungry, right? When we say the dermatologist hugged a hungry girl, all of a sudden this adjective um, is very transient, right? It's, it's, not, it's not permanent. It's not a property necessarily of the individual, but it's a property of, you know, a certain um, state that the, that the individual is in currently, right? 
So, so the idea here is that, and, and, and this difference has been connected to the different scale structures of these adjectives. And again, we're not going to get into, into all the weeds here, but the idea is that that helps us, right? When we see these kinds of differences in adjectives and how they're interpreted, it helps us begin to class adjectives into certain categories. Um, and, you know, some adjectives will, will have both categories. Some adjectives will only have one. It depends on the noun it combines with. There's all kinds of different variables. Um, but the point here is that the degree morphology um, and how these adjectives are combining with degree words um, and and this the adjective scale structures themselves will affect how we interpret adjectives in the end. Just to wrap up here, um, we have looked at derivational and inflectional morphology. And we started out um, just laying the groundwork on what are the differences between derivational morphology and inflectional morphology. The first part, we focused on um, derivational morphology, right? And we looked at roots, categorizers, and derivational affixes. Um, and we touched a little bit on compounding. And derivational morphology um, is how we form words. Next, we looked at inflectional morphology. And we looked in particular at inflectional morphology on nouns, adjectives, and verbs. So these, you know, again, we could have gone way more into detail on any one of these topics. Uh, and, you know, I would encourage you, if you're interested in one, um, look up. We'll have, you know, uh, a place to look up for their works on it. Um, but the the point here, right, is just to introduce these topics, right, and to show you what kinds of questions people are asking in the field, okay? Um, so just to summarize quickly, with regard to derivational morphology, we looked at roots, and roots are the most primitive lexical unit, and all lexical items must have them whether the root is bound or free, right? So that's it's very important um, that we start with roots, and these roots combine with a categorizer to form a word in a certain category, whether it be a noun, adjective, or verb. And then a word can then be further modified by having another derivational affix attached to it to create a new word, either in a new category or in the same category. So again, this was an example like examination. And these affixes themselves have a meaning and constrain the possible interpretations of the new word. Finally, we saw that new words can also be formed by combining two words together to form a compound word. So that was the summary of derivational morphology. Um, then we moved on to inflectional morphology. And we said that the hallmark of the lexical categories was their grammatical properties, not their semantic properties, right? And their grammatical properties were um, determined by functional morphemes that they combined with, okay? So nouns combine with certain functional morphemes. And we said that those are things like determiners, um, numbers, etc. And we also said that they're used as arguments of verbs. So they're used as a subject or a direct object of verbs. Verbs are special in that they have subjects and can be inflected for tense. And adjectives are special in that they modify nouns and have degree morphology. So at this point, let's just return quickly to the beginning question, right? From Embic, I'll just read this again. He says, what is the nature of the primitive units of derivations, i.e., what is the nature of the morpheme? How do morphemes relate to syntactic, semantic, and phonological information? So in answering this question, we said that lexemes basically consist of roots and derivational affixes, which either categorize a root or recategorize words. Both roots and affixes have certain types of meaning that influence the interpretation we end up with in a word. Lexemes may fall into one of three grammatical categories, nouns, verbs, and adjectives, and these morphemes have different semantic and grammatical properties. They combine with different functional morphemes and are, therefore, subject to different kinds of interpretation. 
when we know the basic meaning of these functional morphemes and combine them with the meaning of the lexical morphemes, we arrive at the interpretation of phrases and we can then, com then combine these to form whole clauses and eventually whole discourses. This is how language works compositionally and is built up. In other words, morphemes are the essential building blocks we need to understand language. That's all we have time for on this episode of the Biblical Languages Podcast. Thanks to all of our listeners for joining me, and I hope you enjoyed the episode. <laughs>